I have spotlighted her, I have spotlighted her for this presentation. Um, she is an, a long time experienced farmer uh, and organic seed saver. And she's gonna be walking us through some of the basics of planning uh, the garden for saving seeds come fall. So um, during the workshop, she's gonna be in presentation mode. Uh, myself and Sarah Beaver uh, will be monitoring the chat box. Yuhan Bay is going to be monitoring any kind of chats that come from people in Facebook world. Um, so we ask participants to keep yourselves muted during the presentation. Um, if you have questions, you can chat your questions, type them in the chat box. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a microphone at the bottom left-hand side that's for muting yourself. Um, so if you have barking dogs or traffic or anything like that, keep yourself on mute until we get to the open conversation space. Um, you can also start and stop your video that's right next to the microphone. So, you know, if you need to scratch your face or something like that, you can put yourself to stop video. Um, you can chat with the other participants, see who else is in the room by clicking the participants uh, symbol on the bottom, it looks like two little heads. And then there is the chat box, it looks like a, a talk bubble from a comic strip. If you click in there, you can type your questions there. Um, some of us have the capacity to share a screen, but right now Lisa is the only person sharing screen right now. Um, this uh, is being recorded right now. It's gonna be uploaded onto the Vines YouTube channel and on the Green Thumb webpage. So that way people can access the information on the archives. Um, so if you don't wanna be videotaped, you know, just keep yourself, uh, switch off your video, switch off your uh, microphone you can still ask questions through the chat. Um, and uh, if you have any technical problems, just message us um, and help will be on the way. All right, Lisa, you ready to get started? I am. Wonderful, thank you. All right, thank you to Vines for having me. Um, this is one part of a, I think it's a three-part series. We did one a little bit ago and um, this is the second one and um, geared towards seed saving for beginners and planning a garden with seed saving in mind. Um, you know, I welcome questions as we go. Feel free, you know, kind of, um, I'm known for my digressions and- You know what, Lisa, can I jump in for uh -huh. a second? Yes. A very important thing I forgot to mention and I apologize. Uh, this particular workshop is sponsored by Binghamton University oh, okay. Libraries. They very generously right. received a grant. Yes. Um, and I apologize, we were so busy solving technological issues I, uh, before this. And call I know launched. the library is also a sponsor, mm -hmm. to, is the sponsor too. So, yes, thanks to the library mm -hmm. as well. Um, my apologies on that. <laughs> no, my, my, my fault. It was my job to bring it up. So thank you to, to Jennifer Embry and Nada Gilman, who are on the call, um, who helped make this meeting possible. And um, the, the last in the series is going to be more, um, I think, on the actual harvesting and seed saving. So I'm going to talk more about um, the beginning stages um, and the, the series follows the, the seasons, basically. So um, Let's see if the screen sharing starts working. Um, there we go. Um, so why save seeds? Um, and I really actually like to start with a question, um, what are seeds? And seeds to me are um, the past, the present and the future. Seeds are uh, basically a little time capsule of um, the story of human history. Um, every seed that we have, every plant that we use is somebody's decision, uh, generation after generation after generation to continue that for some specific reason. There's a lot of varying reasons of why save that. Um, traditionally productivity, you know, somebody's like, hey, this this strain, you know, of grain, you know, is much more productive or this, um, you know, more modern tomato. Um, 
you know, productivity was key. You know, humans need to eat, um, but also flavor, um, special attributes. Um, nowadays, there's a lot of like the stripy tomatoes or um, things like that. Um, pretty, <laughs> I call it the pretty factor. Um, but earliness, if you have a, a season that is, of, you know, subject to um, like the Northeast, you know, we have a, can have a shortened growing season. So something that's, um, you know, ripens early can be a great advantage. Uh, disease resistance, there's a lot of uh, funguses, especially, um, but also pests, you know, um, for instance, potatoes that have hairier stems, the the, um, the Colorado potato beetle, which is a huge pest, has a harder time. It is, isn't as attracted to the stems that are slightly more hairy, um, but it could be something like, um, yeah, you know, a brassica that's not as attractive to a flea beetle or something like that. Um, so disease and pest resistance, um, you could have right now and one of Everyone asks me, what is your worst trouble gardening? And everyone thinks I'm going to say pests, but to me, it's actually fungus. Besides the weeds, weeds are always like the number one labor uh, issue, but um, funguses and downy mildew has crept into our area in a lot of different crops. And it's super hard organically to deal with. Um, I get around as much as I can by doing successive crop sowings. Um, so for instance, cucumbers instead of planting them once and be expecting to have you know, cucumbers all season long from one planting. I'll plant three different crops, two weeks apart, staggered. So I always have fresh young plants coming on. Um, but downy mildew, if you can find um, you know, a cucumber that's more resistant to it, um, you wanna save a seed from that plant. Um, sometimes they just have really cool stories, you know, um, you know, an ancestor may have brought seeds over um, when they immigrated here, or, um, you know, there's, you know, the um, radiator Charlie tomato, you know, and he, you know, or the mortgage lifter. Um, the radiator Charlie tomato was named after, uh, he was at the peak of a, or I guess at the yeah, I guess at the peak of a steep climb and that people's radiators would overheat. And he was a mechanic at the top and he grew a garden out back and he had tomatoes and everyone called him Radiator Charlie because he fixed everyone's radiators after they climbed the mountain. Um, uh, so stories, tolerance to a variety of environmental conditions, heat, drought, cold, et cetera. So every time that you are saving seeds, you're putting some sort of selective pressure on. Um, so you know, when we're dealing with climate change now, that's uh, really important. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but anyway, lots of reasons to save seeds, plus they're just interesting. Um, one of the, for beginners especially, the most common um, confusion I see comes around some of these terms, open pollinated, hybrid, and heirloom. And what do these terms mean? Um, and I can't, you don't, I don't really mean to read it to you, but um, open pollinated simply means that the characteristics from the parents, when it's reproducing, the, the seed from the next generation will be true to type of the parents. It's genetically stable. A hybrid, you've crossed two different parents with different characteristics. It's not stable. And you'll have the, um, the F2 generation, um, which is the familial, F stands for the familial generation. Um, so if you save seeds from a hybrid, you'll only get, say, if you remember the little old Punnett squares, um, tw roughly 25% will be similar to the parents, um, which if you are planting a garden, it's a lot of work and that's pretty low percentage. It can be an interesting game to play. Sometimes you get an accidental cross and say like, um, a tomato. So seed saving can also play a role in like breeding your own varieties, where if you have like a chance cross pollination and, um, you know, a bumblebee came along and transferred some pollen, um, you'll get something that, wow, this is great. You love that tomato. It will take, typically the standard is about eight generations of planting and selecting 
to those characteristics that attracted you before you can kind of consider it stable, which is, you know, that's eight gardens. It's a lot of work, um, you know? So generally, especially for beginners, we don't really recommend trying to save seeds from hybrid plants. Um, and if you're buying seeds at the store, say if you go to, you know, whatever, Agway or something, um, you'll see on the seed packet, it, it will tell you if something is a hybrid um, somewhere on the packet. Um, and then heirlooms, by definition, are open pollinated, and they are typically grown for at least 50 years in that kind of standard of form. Um, you still can get lots of variations. Um, I'll go to like the mortgage or well, brandy wine tomatoes. I'll talk a lot about tomatoes because everybody loves tomatoes. Um, well, most people do anyway. I guess I know a few who don't, but um, like brandy wine, there's so many different strains. So there's a lot of heirloom ones and, you know, people over, you know, the, you know, brandy wines are typically a, a large, largish pink tomato, um, but there's a orange brandy wine, there's a yellow brandy wine, there's the seventh strain, which they consider the original strain. Um, you know, so you can get a lot of variations, but there's heirloom is typically over 50 years. Um, and definitely, you know, chat, chat, like type in any questions you have. Um, let's see. It's just a picture of the garden. So these are San Marzano tomatoes. Um, so my question for people thinking of starting to get into seed saving is, you know, how do you decide what you want to grow? Um, and my answer is, what do you like to eat? Um, I mean, the best thing about gardening is getting to grow what you like. Um, my, we, you know, we're a little different. We, we're market gardeners for a living. So we actually grow some things we don't like to eat. Um, my husband hates beets and we still grow a lot of beets. Um, but uh, these are San Marzano tomatoes. Tomatoes are great for beginners. Um, the thing about seed saving with tomatoes, it's wonderful because um, some crops you're going to, you think it out, um, you know, you, Seed saving is neat because you get to see the full cycle of the entire plant. You go from seed to seedling, to flowering, to fruiting, to seed again. You know, so it's a full circle. And um, some things like cucumbers, you, for proper seed saving, you let them mature past an edible stage. But tomatoes, and this is a great case in point, um, are perfect when they're ripe to eat, they're ripe for seed saving, and you can do dual purpose. So these San Marzano tomatoes are great for sauce, typically. I don't use them for sauce, actually, I use a different one or a couple different ones. These, I, I like to, um, they're very meaty, and they have a very small seed cavity. They're actually clean for seed saving, um, because they're actually pretty sparse on seeds overall. But um, I like to slice them in half or quarter them and dehydrate them. And I use them as my, quote, sun-dried tomatoes. And that's how we use most of them. Um, and I'll do, you know, probably maybe four or five gallons worth of them uh, dehydrated and throw them in, you know, soups and stews and whatever. But so when I'm processing them, I just simply slice them lengthwise and you'll see that locule um, the, like where the gel stuff is and the seeds, and you just simply squeeze that out into a bowl as because you don't want them when you're dehydrated. You want to remove the, the juicy part, so to speak, which is where the seeds are. And um, then um, tomatoes are super simple and people kind of don't realize you just, we, a lot of us use the red solo cups um, because they're easily labeled with, and I'm going to talk a lot about labeling because I'm famous for thinking I'll remember and I don't, <laughs> I never do. And then just don't save seeds that you didn't label because it's just you know, useless. But um, I use the red solo cups and I squeeze all that gel into it. And then I just put it in a warm-ish place just on the counter is fine. You can put a piece of saran wrap over it a little if you want to keep flies out. 
and let it ferment for, you know, keep an eye on it, like really two to three days, usually in midsummer is more than sufficient. You don't want to let it go so long that you see little tails of the seeds germinating in the moisture. Um, but you want that layer of like thick, stinky mold that covers the cup. Um, it'll stink, it'll smell terrible. And that's okay, that's good. Because um, that fermentation process is also at the same time, uh, that gel that surrounds seeds has an anti-germination compound in it. So it's breaking that down. And it's also sterilizing the seeds and preventing uh, seedborne pathogens that fermentation process. And then I just simply um, usually do it outside because it stinks, but um, take the hose on a gentle stream of water and decant and your um, good seed will sink to the bottom. Remember it by the, um, you know, you want a nice plump viable seed. So they're the heaviest seeds and they'll sink to the bottom. And then all the, as you're stirring up the water, um, all the pulp and gunk and the lighter seeds that aren't viable will float to the top and you decant that off. I love to use uh, coffee filters to dry seeds on for any of the wet process seeds because they don't stick to them. Some people use paper towels and then they it st seeds stick and that's really annoying. Um, coffee filters are great though and plus you can write right on them what the seed was. And it doesn't seem like a, you know, if you're just doing one kind of seed, like, a, you know, San Marzano tomatoes, um, it's not a problem, but, you know, like I have friends that save hundreds of different kinds of tomatoes in any given season. So anyway, it's good to label. And this was a cool um, stand. This is not my picture. Um, this was from a friend from, it was actually in Europe, I can't remember what town, but it was a you know, nice biodiversity display. Um, look at all that stuff, really cool. And seed saving is great, gardening in general is great because you get to grow stuff that you're not going to commonly see at the grocery stores. Um, there's a lot of interesting varieties, but I just loved all the you know, diversity this picture and so say you know all pr probably i'm pretty sure all that would be open pollinated i'm like looking i recognize some of it um all stuff that you can save seeds from uh actually i'm going back to that picture so one question i get a lot of time um you know if you go to the grocery store there are some things that you can save seeds from one would be mature peppers um but a lot of people asked me about saving seeds from squashes that they find at a farmer's market or a grocery store. I don't recommend that um, because you don't know where they were grown. Um, and I know if you bought one from me, for instance, I grow a lot of different kinds of squashes right in close proximity. We're gonna talk about crossing. Um, and with squashes in particular, um, you know, it's the next generation that you, you save the seeds from its next generation, you, the um, crosses would be apparent. And with squash, squash in particular, um, you don't always get something that's edible. You might get um, something just very bland and sipid kind of, or very tough and stringy. I mean, there's just so much that can go wrong. Um, so anyway, it's hard, it's hard to find one at a roadside stand and, and get what you plant back, in my opinion. Um, you know, and I'm not going to get into this a whole lot, but it helps, there's lots of books out there, there's the internet, but it helps if you know a little bit about the life cycle of a plant. Um, just knowing what crosses, what, what family things belong to, um, and just the basic botany of which are selfers, I call them, which, which plants self-pollinate and which need to cross-pollinate. Um, so which you need two plants of the same variety to cross um, to get a fruit. Um, which, just looking at this picture, which isn't the most clear picture, it's a little blurry, but this is the center of a cosmos and until I was a seed saver, I never really stared into the center of a cosmos plant and understood why it was named cosmos, but it looks like a universe with all the little stars. So I was like, 
Yeah, so seed saving teaches you to pay more, you know, like detailed, close attention to things. Really cool. Um, very cool. Look at those stars, they're perfect. And just the perfect name, the cosmos. Um, so, you know, just talking about the life cycle of the plants, it's, you know, seedlings right to the seed. Um, am I going too fast for people? I'm just kind of moving along here, but. Um, so another thing I want to talk about, which is kind of something I'm only recently um, thinking more and more about is there's different approaches to seed saving. A lot of what I do has always been variety preservation. I work um, with specific collections and we try to keep what we have as distinct types. But especially with climate change, this is where the climate change, um, I don't know if any of you have heard of a land race, but it's a more a genetically diverse that has um, a resilience to changing con conditions. I mean, I just read it off my thing, but um, I think this is where the role of um, planting more of a, a more, well, a land race approach can really be a beneficial thing when we're thinking about larger scale problems such as climate change. Um, so it's basically, uh, and I encourage you to check out um, Joseph Lo uh, Lofthouse is uh, on social media, but he's just releasing a book. It's not even all the way out yet. I think the beta readers are just finishing up. It's about to be released um, about his work with land races. And I've met Joseph and um, some really neat work that he's doing. He has the Promiscuous Tomato Project, um, but he also works with squashes. Um, he does a bunch of different things, but anyway, um, so if you look at the harvest out of his fields, it's going to be a, a huge variety of phenotypes. Um, you never know where those genes are hidden for um, a, you know, you know a, a, basically a plant's response, um, you know, ability to respond to a specific condition. Um, say drought is going to be more common or um, a corn. I mean, storms are more frequent and more violent, you know, higher winds, you know, a lot of corn lodges, um, which just means it blows over and then it's hard to harvest. And, and once it hits the ground, it tends to mold, um, you know, so if you have a corn that has better prop roots, um, that can withstand storm. I mean, but if you keep a land race, you're, you're it's more a, a broader pool of genes to pull from, you know, whereas variety preservation, which is what I do, a lot of, um, you know, you're more looking for a very specific, trying to keep exactly what you planted. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, just my thing is just identify goals. What do you want to do? What's important to you? There, there's actually, you know, for every seed saver, there's, your your priority you get to do what you want um this is a good example of identifying goals this is a little bit different goal so this corn this corn is actually what got me really going um so this is from a friend i work with the experimental farm network project nate Kleiman, um and this project, it's a state saving um, project, and he has a small scale seed company. You can find it online. Um, and they specialize in crops that are um, threatened by human activities, especially climate change and civil war. Um, we don't even think about sometimes the great losses that are incurred in wars where if seed banks are bombed, um, yeah, you know, or um, one of the things that I grow is a sorghum. It's called coral, and I've talked about this before. Um, sorghum is not commonly grown in this country except for animal feed. This is one that is for people, and it's 
origins are uh, South Sudan and a village Malakal, which was destroyed at Civil War. And the USDA maintains a series of um, seed banks and um, Nay got it, it uh, the sorghum out and um, sent around to farmers. And the plan is when the village is resettled, because when, when the village is destroyed, a very common thing, like look at the Iroquois with the Clinton Sullivan campaign. First thing they do is control the food supply. You know, if you want to control the people, control the food. And they destroyed, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres and pounds of, of food. Um, this happened also, you know, the war, you know, atrocity, um, and it happened in this village of Malaka in South Sudan. So the plan is once they resettle, that we'll be able to give them fresh seed back. So this is another one seed from the um, Experimental Farm Network project that Nate um, got for, I asked him for upstate New York kind of uh, oriented seed. And he came up with this corn, which is called Katie Wheeler's corn. And it is a um, very small ears, only, I don't know, four, eight, five, four or five inches, little snub nose ears, but colorful. Um, it's a calico corn. Anyway, I put this on my Facebook page and a guy contacted me. We're now friends, but it was Stephen McCumber, who's a elder, amongst the Haudenosaunee seed keepers. And he is the person who named it Katie Wheeler Corn. He co first collected it at her place and she was still alive, um, I think on the Cotaragas Reservation. Anyway, he had lost his seeds of this corn. He had shared out, but it wasn't commonly grown and it just fell by the wayside. So uh, he saw this on my page and he asked if I would send him some of these ears back, which I did. Um, but the kind of interesting thing, just talking about seed um, selection and identifying goals, Steve didn't like the yellow in this third ear from the left. Um, he liked the pinks, whites, and purples. So he selected against it. And, but it was still in the genes. It was still hiding in there, you know, years. I mean, this, we're going back, it's, I forget if it's the 60s or 70s, he first collected it. And it had been grown out for the pink, white, purple. And um, he was very happy to see that I had one with yellow still in it because that is actually the original, how it was supposed to look. Sometimes the genetics hide, you know, and then they'll pop out again at later, later scenes. Um, I wanna just give you some just quick general growing um, when you're seed saving. Um, the growing, um, when you design your garden, you want to realize like, um, say if you wanna grow lettuce for seed, um, lettuce is super easy. It's a self-pollinating, even though it looks like a little dandelion fluff, like it makes these little yellow flowers. Um, lettuce actually gets to be about three, four feet tall um, on average. And it's a little bit annoying that, um, the seed doesn't all mature at once. So you wait until it's about 50 per, so it'll, it looks like little Christmas trees. Lettuce to harvest to eat, you wanna harvest it, you know, young without any center growth, no center stalk coming up, no vertical growth. Um, but once you are saving it for seed, you want it to fully grow. And you have to realize like, if that space you wanted, like for me, I'm, my main, really my main, crops, one of my crops is lettuce, um, and it's a very quick turnover. So a lot of times I can double plant the same area. Once you're saving seed, you cannot do that anymore because you have to add on enough time for the maturity of the seed crop, which with lettuce is actually another probably six weeks or more. Um, but anyway, so the plant gets to be about three, four feet tall. And what I like to do, once it is about 50% of like, um, looks like dandelion's gone to seed a little white excuse me, fluff, um, is take a, like a paper shopping bag and put it over the plant and then pull it out by the roots and um, just kind of let it dry right in there. And it will, uh, a little bit more will actually come to maturity um, once you do that. I forget the name of it for that process. But anyway, um, 
you can also, um, so talk about timing of the garden, you know, just plan it out so that you give your seed crops enough time to mature to dry seed. Um, but you can also consider timing. Um, if you have two crops that will cross, for instance, you can space them out. My example is going to be corn. Corn is pretty easy to save seed from if. Um, you have to understand corn is wind pollinated. So you have to know what's going on in your vicinity. If you live in a farm country and there's a lot of like field corn around you, I don't really recommend you trying um, because a lot of the field corn nowadays is GMO anyway, it'll contaminate your seed. Um, but pollen can go on the wind pretty far, like can be picked up in a thunderstorm and travel. Um, our garden, we do see, we don't have a lot of big farm crops near us, but, um, and we are surrounded on three sides by woods. So some, sometimes you're also geographically um, protected like that. Um, and typically I, I like to do a sweet corn for farmer's market. And I also like to do a field corn to save seed from, um, and they will cross and they will make each other not great. Um, but if you time it by separating the uh, maturity by two weeks, um, you can grow both successfully. If you grow, if you need to grow more than one, and I should have put some pictures of it, if you need to grow more than one at a time of corn, you can also cover the tassels of the ears with um, like paper bags again, I staple it around the bottom. And then I, I also bag the pollen spikes and then Corn pollen is, um, it degrades in heat pretty quickly. So it's best to collect it in the morning. And I just go down the row and I collect, I, I give the, the pollen spikes a shake and kind of bend the stalk over, remove the bag. And then I combine all the bags into one bag. And then one by one, I go down the row of the ears and take the bag off, sprinkle some corn pollen on each ear. You can trim the pollen kind of flush across um, the, I, I'm sorry, the silks flush across and then sprinkle right on the ends. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize about corn, um, which I still am fascinated by, is I'm sure you've all eaten corn on the cob. When you peel that back, if you do it gently, you'll see each of those silk each strand of silk, one, one kernel has one strand of silk attached to it. And each, each silk is actually a pollen tube. That is what a corn silk is, which I was like, wow, that's so cool. Um, but if you actually, so if you, next time you are husking your corn, do it like gently layer by layer and look at it and it all lines up with each, each successful kernel will have one strand of pollen of silk attached to it. And when you get poor pollination, you'll see that there's no big gaps with the kernels don't form. It's because that strand of silk didn't get pollinated. Um, so you can hand pollinate corn. Um, it's a labor of love. And um, if you're going to grow corn for seed, um, I highly recommend you do at least, and I think I talked about it maybe the next slide, at least a plot of 200 plants for a, a good population because corn is already one of the most inbred crops we have. All of pretty much all sweet corn these days comes from four genetic lines, um, just four, you know? And if you only are taking a small um, genetic population to save seed from, it, it, it just gets run down pretty fast. Um, watering, you know, um, and you get, I mean, there's a million things we can talk about on timing too, but um, you know, I tend to talk too much. I don't want to go over. And uh, watering, you know, it's just important to take care of your seed crops. Just make sure they're as vigorous and healthy as you can to get good, you know, fat, viable seed. Um, spacing, I tend to go um, with a bit wider spacing, even. Um, and I think I'll talk about isolation on a different one, but um, you know, you just want to take care of the crop and give it its best chance. So I space things out, I stake things, trellis things, um, 
just give it you know the best growing conditions possible. Um, Seedborne diseases, don't save seed from anything sick. Um, a lot of it, sometimes it's just like a um, environmental reason that it's sick and it's not necessarily a seedborne disease, but really you wanna save seed from your healthiest plants, not, not something, you don't wanna perpetuate. Some seedborne diseases are really bad and you don't wanna perpetuate anything. So um, I tend to save the best of the best. My best example being garlic and I have a picture of my garlic somewhere in here. Um, I grow a lot of garlic and people are always telling me that their garlic's real small now. It's like the size of a quarter, or, you know, tiny and what happened. And um, if any of you come to my stand at the farmer's market, you, you, you know I have nice garlic. Well, you guys never even see my good garlic because my best garlic is what we save seed for. That's the thing we've been saving seed for the longest is um, garlic. It's been almost 30 years. And we got it from one guy who grew it in Apple Lake and for another 30 years before that. Um, but our best of our best is kept for seed because, you know, obviously genetics, especially garlic because it's clonal, um, you know, you'll have the best chances if you save your best. Um, roguing off types, super, super important. If I have a bean, beans are also highly recommend beans. I think a lot of you know that I'm really into beans, but um, beans are great because they're self they don't cross readily with others. Um, so anyway, rogue, I'll talk more about beans on one of these next pictures. Uh, roguing off types. If I have a bean that's supposed to be a bush bean and I have it like a semi runner or even a, you know, like a whole bean. And a good example is the, a black bush bean called black turtle beans. And some of them are super viney. You should really ideally go through and take out when it's growing when you can see clearly, take out, just pull it out, any off types. Um, if you have a, uh, you know, let's see. Well, even like a sun, I think I have a picture of sunflower. You know, if I go, if I want to say of a certain sunflower, um, which are super easy to do, you know, I typically grow one variety a year because so, they'll cross. But, um, you know, some of them are all, like if I grow mammoth, say, I want them to be tall, tall, um, obviously the name mammoth, but, or else I used to do a um, tubular petal one. There, sometimes the, the tubular petals were very staggered, like a big gap between them. You know, so I, I didn't like those. I liked them a little more full and fluffy looking. So um, always rogue out your off types and, you know, just save yourself a lot of trouble. And, you know, some people feel really bad. Like I find that people have trouble with that also are the people that don't like some carrots and stuff because they're like, oh, but they're little babies. They're still good, they'll grow. Yeah, but you know, um, here's like sunflowers. So see, there's like, if you start looking down the row, you can see the shorter ones in there. I want the tall ones, you know, that's one of my things I'm gonna be looking for. And I won't save seed from the short ones there. Um, just that bigger uh, pollination. Um, so I just put on two examples. One, bees. Um, that's actually on crimson clover there. So pretty. Um, yeah, but there's an example of something that um, cross pollinates, and then the corn is is you know is insect. I'm sorry, insect pollinated, and then corn is wind pollinated. You just you have to know how things are reproducing. Um, so, and if you learn how to manage it, you can. Um, you know, breed for desired characteristics. Um, and I think I already made the point that each time you save seed, you're exerting selective pressure on each generation. So, um, and a lot, I get, usually get a lot of questions on squashes and cucumbers. Um, and especially for beginner seed savers, when you look at a squash or cucumber flower, I'll use it interchangeably, um, how can you, you have your male flowers and your female flowers? Some things are perfect flowers and you have male and female. This is, um, I should have taken sideways picture or put, put them up. Um, when you look at a squash or a cucumber flower, if it's a male, it'll be on a long slender stalk down to the stem or the vine. 
um, the females will have teeny tiny little fruits at the base of the flower, um, which you'll see right from as soon as it starts forming, you can tell there's a little tiny fruit at the base. Those are your females. Um, you can um, selectively cross. So if you are deliberately crossing something, you can, um, I would take each petal and pull it backwards and just kind of pull it off. And then I would use it like a little, use that little, um, uh, like a paintbrush and paint the female. I take the male petals off and then just have that uh, stamen there with the pollen and paint the female. And then you cover it back up so no bee comes along. Um, so, you know, it's really easy to use. Um, a lot of us use them uh, and squashes and also tomatoes, um, peppers um, is those little organza bags that you can find at like Joanne Fabrics or Michael's or whatever. Um, they're in the wedding section and they're nice because they're lightweight and so they let air through and things you can see through them, but the bugs can't get into them and they have nice little ties around the um you know the pull and then once the fruit is set and you know that you have hand pollinated that that one so you want to mark it um and so you can take the bag off and i tie it around the base of that like the stem right where that fruit is um or a truss of tomatoes or whatever um yeah just i mean you can get like a whole pack of them like for a couple of dollars it's cheap um and that way you can know that you know say you wanted to keep your squash pure um and prevent if you grew more than one kind of squash you could do it and hand pollinate it and cover it to prevent other pollen I that's just a pretty picture on the zinnia um butterflies also transfer a lot of pollen around um tomatoes I kind of actually already talked a lot about tomatoes, so I think I'll just skip that one. Um, variety maintenance. Uh, so isolation requirements. Um, so things like corn, the isolation is like half a mile. So is it squash? Um, if you are living in an area where you know you can't control what your neighbor's growing or anything, um, so sometimes distance is a problem. Um, sometimes you can change it up with timing, like I mentioned with the corn, or containment, like I mentioned with the organza bags to isolate. Sometimes you can build mesh cages around something, if some, like a something's big enough. Um, and I already talked about the population size. To maintain a, a variety, you should really maintain a healthy genetic population. Um, you can't just do. There are there are exceptions and reasons. Sometimes, um, for example, Steve McCumber, the man I was talking about with the corn, he um, brought back Mohawk red bread corn um, from the verge of extinction, and it was down to one cob was left. Um, one of the interesting things also that, because uh, I, I do work with an indigenous collection, one of the interesting things also is different perspectives, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I was talking to someone once, I think it may have been Rowan White, I think, um, about purity and corn and stuff. And sometimes you'll see a kernel that's a different color that doesn't belong. And you know, you think, oh, you know, I failed. I didn't, you know, keep it, you know, pure enough and everything. And a lot of indigenous and more traditional cultures will um, view it more as the, it's a visitor. And I thought it was a lot nicer way of looking at it. So, um, yeah, and this is just talking, I think I already talked about this, um, just how long past a normal harvest period. I mean, tomatoes are fine. Peppers, also, if you want to harvest or, and save seeds from peppers, totally easy to do. Again, because it's the um, you know mature stage, but you don't want to save seeds from green peppers. You want to save them from the mature color, which is going to be red, orange, yellow, depending. Uh, hot pepper seeds are really easy to save. Um, seed, seed hot peppers. Um, 
beans. Beans I like. Beans, the one on the left is a Mother Earth bean. Bean on the right is a Ugandan bean. Um, pretty interesting. Um, beans are, like I said, are pretty much self selfers, which means they self-pollinate. Beans actually self-pollinate before the blossom even opens typically, which is great. Um, when you get crosses and beans, a lot of times, 95% of the time, um, they're going to be true to type. The 5% remaining is typically due to bumblebees that once that blossom um, you know, has already pollinated, but before it falls off, the bumblebee has strong jaws and will actually chew, you'll, you'll see it, they'll, they'll chew holes through the sides of the blossom looking for nectar. Um, and so some of the bean crosses come from bumblebees, typically. Um, pretty interesting, though, but they're very easy. So I am known as the bean lady. I actually maintain a collection of about a thousand different bean varieties. It's a lot of work. A lot of work. So, let's see. Um, also, it really helps if you select seed that's appropriate for your geographic region, especially if you're a beginner. Um, and then the seed picture does not go with the second question, but does it need cold to germinate? You, you just My point is you need to know what kind of conditions. Lots of biennials need cold to germinate. Biennials just means a crop that flowers in the like it has the first year of vegetative growth and actually flowers and reproduces the second year. So it includes things like a lot of the root crops like carrots and rutabagas and beets, um, which brings me to a great point. A lot of people um, get excited. Biennials are a lot of work. I actually don't do a lot of biennials um, or many at all. Um, I have, but it takes a lot of work. Um, one of the things with them is like say Swiss chard, if you have, or a carrot, um, you have a carrot that flowers the first year and you think, oh yay, I'm going to save seed from that. Or, oh, here's another good example, lettuce. Lettuce is actually even better example. Um, a lot of people try and save seeds from the first lettuce plant that bolts because they get excited and everything. That is not the genetics that you want to be continuing. Um, yeah, a lot of people grab that first, get excited, oh, it's gone to seeds, let me get the seeds. Well, you, you don't want a lettuce. That's what goes back to identifying your goals. So you don't want a lettuce that's going to bolt right away. Um, but, or a carrot that goes to seed the first year or beet or Swiss chard, you, you're looking for things that are, you know, what are the characteristics of the plant that you want, so. Um, and going, let me just go back for a second. Also, um, the stratification thing, a lot of people try and grow milkweed um, for monarch butterfly habitat um, and other things. Um, it needs to be cold stratification thing. A lot, of, a lot of flowers and herbs need cold stratification. I'm doing larkspur right now, loves it cold. It needs that cold period. Um, you know, here I am checking, you know, the, um, you know, quality, you know, am I happy? This is, a, I think this was a corn called Cherokee wampum dent corn, which came from the same person that uh, developed the um, glass gem popcorn, which a lot of you know, probably it's so pretty. This is a different one though. This is a purple and white, whoops, wrong way, purple and white corn that I, I grind it for, it's very, um, it's a dent corn, but it's a very, I got a couple different dent corns that I grind for cornmeal. This was a much more flowery one than my main one, like a very fine. Um, also, I don't care, beginner, may as well learn it now, because even I've done it for a long time and I suck at this. <laughs> um, but record keeping, label, label, label. I can't even tell you how many times I've been like, I'll remember, I never do. Um, yeah, which is always tragic after a whole season growing something and then forgetting what it is. The next time you go to look at it in a bag, being like, oh, little brown bean, hmm. they don't look the same. Um, but it's really nice if you are good at record keeping. Things that I think 
are nice to know is when you know the date you sow it, the germination rate, emergence, you know, is it you know pops right up or is it struggling? Is it, you know, what's the vigor like? Um, it's nice to know when it starts to flower, where the seed came from, um, population size, harvest date, disease pressure, seed lot, if you have more than one. Um, I work um, with this indigenous, you can see on the left, well, in both of them, I don't know if you can read the writing, it's pretty small, but um, with an indigenous um, seeds from my friend, Chris Hubbard, and I can't pronounce it. I can't spell it without looking at it. So one of my um, tricks is I take photographs of it when I plant it. I can't I take a, I, I like photography, fortunately. So I take a picture of the seed of what it looks like because I'm not familiar with any of them. Um, what it looks like when I plant it, when it's growing, I'll take a picture of it. I'll try and take close-ups and I'll hold up the label in, in the picture. These are actually two different ones, but I'll hold up the label in the picture um, and I'll do close-ups on the blossom color because a lot of these beans that I'm doing for Chris are almost at the verge of extinction. When a lot of people don't know anything about them. They might've been down to the last four or eight seeds that are in existence and he might give me two seeds. Um, so, you know, nobody knows like what color flower it is, how vigorous of a plant is it? Does it grow to the, that's an eight foot pole there. Does it grow to the top or is it only halfway up? Is it a half runner? We just don't know. So I'd like to photograph it all. And then I'll photograph it at harvest with the label again in the photograph. So I can compare, does it look like the original that I planted? You know, sometimes it's crossed, sometimes, you know, which would have crossed the previous generation. So um, anyway. Yeah, photography is a good way. So everybody has a camera in their pocket now. So take a picture and, and um, go through your Google Photos and it makes for a good little record keeping. Um, here's a picture of some of Chris's beans. This is, I call it the Chris Hubbard collection. He's a Cherokee seed keeper out of Kentucky. And these are pole beans. Um, it looks kind of cool. There's a close up of the picture, but you can see I got the, you know, that's a dark lavender flower in there um, in the vigor of it. And then I'll take close ups of the pods when the pods are maturing. Some of the pods will be like streaked with pink or whatever. And then as I'm harvesting, again, I'll take it, um, a photograph. And there, there's a, a little bit bigger so you can actually see it. Um, one of the Narragansett ones. And like he'll have notes on it, like what family he sourced it from, originally where it was from. This was just a pretty picture. Zinnias are great, flowers are great. Um, just, you know, when they're dry and crumbly, you know, when they're brown, don't look so pretty anymore. Go through and ruffle them up, and grab some seeds. Um, squash suggestion it's hard for beginners to grow squash, I feel personally, but. Uh, this is where knowing your botany comes into handy is knowing Moshada, Pepo, Maxima, the family is Cucurbita, um, or well, genus is Cucurbita. Um, it's in the Cucurbitae family. But um, Moshada, Pepo, and Maxima are your three main squashes that you're going to encounter in the Northeast here. Um, Moshada is like your butternuts. Um, Pepo, is um, your acorns and your delicata, which are those yellow stripy ones, but it's also your zucchini and your yellow summer squash, um, which presents a problem. And then your maxima is more your pumpkin family ones. Um, you can tell the difference with your stones and stuff. So anyway, what do you do when you want to save a bunch of squash seeds? I would recommend you can pick one from each of those species. Um, the main problem people have is the pepo. Um, you have to decide and alternate years because one year of saving cucumber seed is, yeah, which is a different, well, actually I shouldn't use cucumber, I'll say zucchini, sorry, uh, zucchini seed. Um, one year saving zucchini seed might give you several years worth of seed. 
and then yeah, you know, another year you save seed from the delicata, and a different year save seed from your acorn, um, and just rotate through. Just pick one from each family or group um, to save seed from in any given year. Um, cucumbers are their own thing. Cucumber is mellow, so you know you can save one variety of cucumber per year. Um, cucumbers. Squashes, winter squash are great because again, they're when when they're mature to eat, they're mature to harvest their seeds. So just whenever you you know split one open to bake, you can scoop out the seeds, rinse them off, and spread them out to dry well. Um, the key to all seed saving is to dry it really well. Don't put it in a dehydrator. You don't want to dry it at temperature. Just room temperature, air dry. That's fine. Um, stir the seeds around once in a while so they don't get moldy, that kind of thing. Um, I forget where I was going with that, but anyway. Uh, oh, cucumbers. If you're going to save cucumbers, um, those are ones that you save past the eating stage. When we eat them, the, the seeds are kind of small and um, flat um, and soft. Whereas if you're doing it for seed production, you let it get to that orange, like hard skin orange look to it. Doesn't even look like a cucumber anymore. Then it's ready to save seeds from. It's kind of stinky and gross, but um, those I also do wet processing. Um, well, actually here it is. Um, mix them up in watermelons. I do wet to mix some, mix the, scoop up some of the flesh with the seeds and mix it up with some water and swish it around, agitate it, and then drain off um, the pulp, all that pulp stuff. I explained already tomatoes. Dry processing, there's a lot of things that, you know, so you just have to know the maturity, like what things, um, lettuce, beans, a lot of flowers, a lot of herbs are just dry. They usually involve a threshing and winnowing process where you can use like colanders, baskets, kind of flip it up in the air on a rainy day and let the chaff blow off. Um, threshing just generally means like with my dry beans, because I grow so many, I put them in like a feed sack and I beat them with like a, I use a flail, but you can beat them with a stick or step on them when they're nice and crunchy to dry and then break off all the break open all the pods and then pour them back and forth on a windy day um, and that's called winnowing then after you've done the processing removing the plant material from the seed that you want i spread it out like on a cookie tray i i sort out for undersized or damaged seeds make sure it's thoroughly dry and then label 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 i'm almost done here um, Here's the garlic harvest that I was telling you about. This is one of about two wagons. We grow about 6,000 garlic. Um, Megan sitting next to me is about to meet my daughter-in-law in five weeks. So, and here's a nice, I pre-COVID did, um, used to do a lot of seed swaps. This is a nice picture of saving the best of the best. Those are perfect, flawless. Um, that's a narrow, nice, I think it was a Narragansett. No, I'm sorry, this is a, I think this is a Dutch butter popcorn. The Narragansett was, I had a picture, it was white flint. Um, here's another one of the beans. So see, I've taken out all the bad beans and now I'm down to all the good beans. Um, anything that's, you know, any moldy look or um, undersized, not viable, I've, you know, gone through, sorted, and removed. So, and these are fully dry, and now they're able to be stored, fully labeled. So, and here's a good example of a nice label. You can see sourcing, um, translation, because it is. This is my friend Ben Cohen's um, picture, and just, you know, um, as a beginner, this is just where we're ending, but um, as a beginner, hopefully now that we get back to normal soon and there's a lot of seed swaps, it's so much fun. Seed swaps are super social, um, make some really good friends, make some really cool people, swap seeds. And I mean, I will literally <laughs> drive to like Kentucky. I will drive all the way from New York to Kentucky first weekend in April uh, just to go to the Pikeville Seed Swap, which is in a high school auditorium in the middle of coal mining Kentucky region. 
um, just the greatest people and you get to meet and hear stories. It's a, seed swaps are a bit all about storytelling and uh, making friends. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. And is there any questions you guys have for me or? Any questions from the audience? You can unmute yourselves or we can read from the chat box. We've had like a lot of sharing in the chat box, Lisa, of people's experiences. And it looks like Austin has his hand raised. Would you like to unmute and ask your question, Austin? Um, yeah, uh, I'm curious, what have you been, or what have you found to be the most effective way to label things outside where they're subject to the elements without oh, the marker great, disappearing or something? That's a really, really great question because I'm always like squinting, what the heck? Um, don't believe permanent sharpies they're not permanent they fade um it depends on how big your garden is some people will stamp metal tags if you're really like always growing the same thing those are really nice um but i grow too many different things so i get uh, like ac moore or michaels or whatever will have oil paint sharpies those won't fade those the oil paint ones um, they're kind of annoying. You got to shake them up in that little ball in the middle, um, keep the paint flowing, but um, they're pretty rugged. I've had good results of that. Also, I don't know if you noticed, um, it depends on your situation, but because I might have rows, because I'm doing so many varieties of beans, like I literally might have five foot sections, or not five foot, even less than five feet. I'll have five seeds of one variety and then five seeds of a different variety. Um, so I go through a lot of tags and I will cut up mini blinds. Like if you go to the dollar store or thrift store, buy mini blinds and cut them up, you can have like years worth off of one mini blind. Um, the problem is you got to keep track of them because you don't want to have plastic being a problem in your field. And you also, um, I had crows pulling them up one year because they were white and bright or something. That was very <laughs> annoying. Um, yeah. But anyway, those oil paint Sharpie markers are, are pretty, they're pretty sturdy. So. Cool. I had another question too, uh -huh. which was, um, how do you, uh, you mentioned the name Joseph Law House or how do you Lo spell Loft, that? Uh, Loft House, L-O-F-T-H-O-U-S-E, Loft House. And actually this guy here, at this last slide, um, Small House, uh, he just released a new book this yesterday. So I think yesterday at ours in um, Herbalist, but he also, his that's his third book. His first book is Seeds and Their Keepers and I'm featured in it. I have a chapter in it, so go out and you can actually contact me if you want to are interested in buying a, uh, a copy I think it's like ten dollars now um uh, that's more a story telling book um but yeah that that small house in this last slide is Bevan Cohen um another good guy so. cool I think that's all the questions I had uh, if anyone okay. else wants to go Lisa, do you want to stop sharing your screen so you can see the participants better? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Wait, let's see. I well, see. Um, there was a question in the chat about the seed swaps. Okay. So when when is the next seed swap and how is that happening during the pandemic? Yeah, during the pandemic, most of them have been canceled. They're now just now starting to pick up again. Um, hopefully they're hoping by the fall that they might there might be some getting going. Um, I know Tompkins County has one in spring i think i want to say it's in april um at the cooperative extension i'm trying to think of local ones there's not a lot local i was, I was thinking of doing like an on-farm one um at some point because and i do speaking of that i do host tours and workshops on farm sometimes um once we are getting kind of back to no normal um 
So, yeah, I think an on farm would, would be too cool too, because then you know you can walk around. The one of the um, ones down in Kentucky, it seems like the it's more there's more culture around it because um, of the topography. I think the down, um, especially in the Southeast, there was a lot of like hills and hollows and a lot of geographic isolation. And so a lot of family, there's so many family beans, for instance, that each family has like the family bean that's passed down generation to generation. It's distinct from the next hollow over. And there was just so much like geographic isolation there that um, seed saving is um, really different, um, more uh, cultural thing. And um, in the South, I know John Koikendall, um, who works with Blackberry Farm, um, I think is in Tennessee, but he goes to one of the parishes in Louisiana every year and has, um, oh, I just saw Nita put on, yeah, uh, I just got distracted with Nita's, um, the public library which is where my farmer's market is, is having a CD Saturday on April 24th that will include seed slopping, which I will bring some stuff. Um, hopefully the weather cooperates. Um, any good native flower recommendations for pollinator gardens? Um, there's whole, you know what I would do is, um, because I don't have a specific pollinator garden, it's not my strength, but I would call up the master gardeners at Cooperative Extension. They could like completely you know, yeah, that, that would be a great source for pollinator garden recommendations. Let's see. And I guess, Lisa, one, one question mm -hmm. that I think is good to think about is really like to see all the people who are gathered here right now. Um, what I would like to know is um, we're going to have a third seed saving workshop that's more geared towards the fall. Uh -huh. And so I wonder, like, what's what's important to think about right now in the springtime versus in the fall? What can people look forward to in the workshop? Not to put you on the spot, <laughs> but what's going to be different about what we talk about? In the I'm. Fall? I, I'm hoping some hands-on demonstrations of actual harvest techniques of different things and different, one of the big things is cleaning and storage methods, um, which, you know, cleaning, storing it one step wrong is going to ruin it for the whole season's work. So we'll be doing more of that kind of thing. It would be neat if like, can do it like in the field. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe we can do something that's uh, maybe we'll plan this time you came into town to do the video, but maybe mm -hmm. we plan a little more we come up to your site. Yeah, absolutely. Videography there. Yep. Clients, if we can find a Wi Fi location. So, anyway, really, um, I'm just reading the notes. So, yeah. You guys did a good job at like keeping up with like all sorts of links and stuff. Oh, no, Jen, you're saying that you're growing some of Joseph's things. Is Jen still here? Yeah, I'm here. What are you growing of Joseph's? I'm growing his peppery beans and his cowpeas this year. Uh huh. Yeah, he's super into them too. I gave him a yeah. bunch of fava beans. I wondered if you were doing any of the favas. Some of them came from me. Um, he, I did a, a workshop with a bunch of the, the people at NOFA. And um, Joseph said, the difference between me and him is I have a thousand beans all in a thousand different little jars and he has a thousand beans in one big jar. <laughs> so, <laughs> like that pretty much sums it up. Um, <laughs> totally different approaches but yeah he's he's very interesting so. oh he's amazing yeah i've read a lot of his stuff on the open source breeding forum yeah and stuff yeah. yeah yeah so i hope to do a lot more next year especially as um, promiscuous tomatoes so yep he has promiscuous tomatoes yeah <laughs> um somebody's saying cilantro and dill yeah super great 
for pollinators, uh, especially like, yeah, that's the me as well. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the hoverflies, especially, um, which I have it the statistics in another PowerPoint. I don't remember it, and I think it was search search hoverflies, and I think it was New York Times article did uh, and Science Times did a thing on hoverflies, and it was just amazing that they actually migrate, which I did not know um, that they migrate in such vast numbers that they actually are picked up on weather radar, and they were like tracking them over the UK and. They actually showed up on the radar, which is just, I mean, hoverflies are tiny. Wow. Not even like, it's not even, yeah, they're tiny, tiny. Um, and they tried to estimate how many trillions of aphids and things that this cloud of hoverflies could consume. It was staggering. Um, but yeah, pretty neat. And one of the neat things I discovered recently was the, is the iNaturalist app. And they, you can, take a photo and it will actually identify quite accurately. And if not, then experts come in and will help you identify what it is. So if mm -hmm. you want to know what your native pollinators are, it's a really useful tool. It is free. You know, Lisa, I had a question. Mm -hmm. And if you already covered it, but you know, that's, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it. But in order to avoid cross pollination, like if you're trying to select a particular seed, Mm -hmm. Do you ever use any kind of barriers or fabric that's Yeah, I, I did talk about it. Um, if you're doing individual blossoms, so I figure beginners, you can also isolate if you have larger quantities with row covers, uh, which are just, if you're not familiar with them, they're like a spun polypropylene and block out insects. Um, typically, it's things that you have to hand pollinate, crawl under there. Then. Um, or um, I also recommended the organza bags that you find in like a wedding section for like tomatoes or you know plants that are big that you can't get a really roll cover over well um or I think it's a really great you can also do uh, like um, build isolation cages something like carrots carrots are interesting which i thought this was cool i have not done carrots myself so carrots you grow the first year and then you um, typically dig them up and they're called stacks then and you store them in cold storage and then you can sort through and figure out which carrots have the characteristics that you want and then you replant them in the spring and when they send up flower stalks and everything they're actually pollinated by a fly and around here they will cross pollinate with the queen anne's lace which you don't want um, so anyway you can build exclusion cages around them with mesh, but then you, you're like, well, you know, you need the flies to pollinate them. So you're kind of stuck. You're excluding because you don't want pollen from the Queen Anne's lace, but yet you need flies. So you can actually buy maggots online of blue bottle flies, which are the main pollinator, and you can actually shake the maggots in and they'll hatch out and pollinate your, your carrot crop in the cage. But yeah, you can buy maggots online. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any other questions from the chat, chat group? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, you did a presentation at Cornell Cooperative Extension for the Master Gardeners there. And you brought your collection of, well, a small amount of your beans. Mm -hmm. And not to sound sappy, but they were the most beautiful things. <laughs> and they're just so pretty. And they have so many of them have such wonderful stories and such wonderful history. And I was completely enamored. Good. I just thought it was <laughs> the convert. best thing ever. <laughs> wonderful. And have I started collecting them yet? No, but it's probably well, in my future. Good. Yeah. It's, I like beans because they're very tactile. Like if you yes. look at tomato seeds, you can't tell the difference between yeah. one tomato seed and the next pretty much, but um, beans are very colorful and tactile. And I used, oh, to, do, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. I used to do um, a lot of beadwork and stuff and it kind of, my eyes suck now, so <laughs> the older <laughs> I get, but um, you know, beans kind of give me that same feel of, you know, all the colors and um, yeah, I, they're very tactile. Just handling mm -hmm. them is very, I really love like harvesting seeds and putting them in a big bowl and you just kind of run your hands through them. And it's just this very, you know, very tactile, wonderful experience. 
and so many of them have such wonderful stories. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I tell people when I first started saving seed, I did it, you know, kind of the more sciencey, like, oh, loss of biodiversity, and mm -hmm. po political, the seed companies being, you know, merging and dropping from the seed trade, all these varieties and, you know, things like that. And then as I get older and older, it comes down to the social and storytelling aspect of it mm -hmm. and just collecting the stories and, and just the, the, bound the uh, binding of people together mm -hmm. it's a uh, you know food is a unifier and learning about other cultures through seed saving i mean i think that's one of the best things that i've gotten out of it is you know and it kind of brings up an interesting you know thing for me right now because i've mentioned i do work with an indigenous collection what with the current state of affairs in the world and just the more i learn and you know the more sensitive i um about having these seeds and i mean the goal is to rematriate them to their people that is the goal um to give them back but um you know i, I am constantly re-examining my place and role in the project um but there's you know because a lot of seeds are taken you know by force and um yeah or lost due to you know cultural trauma oh so. yeah. yes yeah but that was an enjoyable that was a very enjoyable presentation i still Thanks. remember it oh thank you <laughs> um so any other questions i mean i think we've all really enjoyed this presentation today um we're at we're at the 723 mark in terms of time. Uh, I did want to give a plug for Vines. We are offering free seeds and seedlings to people, probably not as exquisite and unique as the seeds that Lisa saves, but if you are in need of safe seeds, uh, you can contact Vines at 607-323-3171. I'm going to put a little link in the chat to our Google form. Um, so that way, if you do want to order seeds or seedlings, we have a very limited supply available. Uh, it's all donation based, so we can't guarantee that we have everything that you want. Um, but you can fill out the form or call our number, and we will try to hook you up with the seeds that we have available. And Yuhan did a lot of work on making sure that that inventory was up to date. So thank you for that. And I'll just put in a quick little pitch for any hey, local people is you can find me at the best of farmers market starting memorial day weekend every wednesday and saturday and we will be at the library but in a new location up by the um western parking lot up by the towards the high school so anyway thank you for coming it was a really nice evening i was kind of skeptical anybody was going to show up so i'm glad you did thank you And guys, please do register for our upcoming workshops. Uh, I think for the next workshop is going to be Hope Townsend teaching gardening 101 on Saturday, April 14th, sorry, April 17th. Um, go to vinesgardens.org backslash events to register. And then we'll have organic pest and disease management with yours truly on May 5th um, at 5.30 p.m. vinesgardens.org backslash events. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yep, thank, thank you. Jennifer. Thank you, Nada. Thank you, Yuhan. And thank you, Sarah, for making this a great event.